Hello. I, t I trust that you're there. I can't actually see you because of the bright lights, so I'm really glad I took a photo of you before. I'm going to try to take a photo now. Can you adjust the lights? It's, this, this is just my way of saying thank you for inviting me. It's really nice to be able to... Oh, everybody's waving. Thank you. That's very nice. So, um, hello. So I work in functional programming, whereas you guys work in the real world. I'm an academic. Uh, how many people have heard of functional programming before? Ooh, wow, great. How many people have not heard of functional programming before? Nobody's admitting it. How many people have heard of Haskell before? Ooh, about the same. How many, who's not heard of Haskell? Oh, good, a couple of people are raising their hands. Some honest people, thank you. Um, who is going to ask me questions during my talk? Please ask me questions during the talk. If I say something you don't understand, it's your job to ask me a question, okay? That, that's very helpful to me and to the rest of the audience, so please be willing to do that. Are there any questions yet? <laughs> Not yet, okay. And, ooh, and why say it's coming up up there? That's great. Thank you, Wendy, the transcriber woman. Let's see if Wendy puts in something to say that she heard me. <laughs> Yay, hello, Wendy. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk to you about a new programming language, which was designed by other people, but which I've written a textbook about. The textbook is called Programming Language Foundations in Aga. How many people went to the lecture the first day where he was talking about this circle of abstraction and syntax and then coming up with new concepts. Okay, that's called Programming Language Design. And my official title is Professor of Theoretical Computing Science, but I'm called that because I, they appointed me because I'm a fairly practical one. So I do theory, but then I tried to turn the theory into things that people use. Um, so I helped design Haskell, I helped design one tiny fraction of Java, and I also helped design a tiny fraction of um, XQuery. Maybe the less said about that, the better. Um, so let me begin by, since there's no other talks here on functional programming, I thought I should represent the functional programming community. So before telling you about the latest thing I've done, let me tell you a wee bit about Haskell. Oh. No, first I have to tell you about Rio de Janeiro. So I come, um, half the year I live in Edinburgh, half the year I live in Rio de Janeiro, whose streets are paved with lambdas. How many people know what a lambda is? Okay, that's most of you. Know. So lambda is very important to those of us who do theoretical computing science because this is the key symbol in the key calculus that encompasses in a very tiny uh, programming language, exactly what you want to do. So Lambda Calculus is the first computer programming language. It was designed in 1932, just before there were stored program computers. Yes, yes, you may all applaud. That's a great idea. So anyhow, as you can see, the streets of Rio de Janeiro are just paved with Lambdas. They're all over. And this is me sitting in um, Vanda's living room writing the textbook that I'm going to tell you about. So let me say a little bit about functional programming in Haskell. So this is our icon for Haskell. And yes, look, it's got a lambda in it. Yay. And it's got this other symbol, which is the symbol for um, the bind operator on a monad, which we will not talk about today, but it's cool. Um, so Haskell, so let me tell you the secret to designing a programming language that everybody uses, get together with a great group of people, argue a lot, design it, publish it, and here's the key step. Wait 30 years. <laughs> or more importantly, spend those 30 years teaching it to your students who will then go out into the world and do amazing things with it. Right? So I. I Right, you're all giggling because it all sounds funny. But this, truly, this is the secret of success. Success doesn't happen overnight. You build it up 
step by step. This is how you get people to use what you do. You do it, you describe it well, you make it easy, as easy to use as you can, and then you give people some time to get used to it. So one of the great things that, in fact, one of my students did, uh, they went off to Facebook, and they designed this framework called Haxel. So um, Haxel filters every single post that you see on Facebook is filtered by code written in Haxel. And the key thing about uh, functional programming in general is it makes concurrent programming, parallel programming, much easier to use. Usually, the way that you do parallel programming is you're, right, you're writing to the memory, and you've got a process over here, it's writing on the memory, and a process over here, it's writing on the memory. And then the process over here gets confused because the memory changed and it wasn't expecting that particular change. Right? How many people have written programs like that? Right. And how many people have written concurrent programs? Yep, yeah, same set. Um, so this is the problem with writing concurrent programs in an imperative world, is that you have many different sources, like that, all making changes to the same shared store, and it's hard to keep track of it. So in functional programming, we use immutable data structures, and that just means um, it, it's like the number three, right? Three is always the number three, and you can talk about it. Um, the string hello is always the string hello, and you can always talk about it, right? And there are now languages, right, that support things like an immutable string hello. It's not like C, uh, well, some people, of course, use C, but in, in C, strings aren't hello, right? You could take the fifth character and change it to a U, so it becomes hello. Um, but normally, right, once you say hello, it stays hello forever. It's immutable. It doesn't change. And if you're writing concurrent software, that's a huge advantage. So you still have problems with concurrency, but the problem you don't have is that somebody else might change what you're doing right underneath your feet. So that makes that's probably one of the main reasons why people in this room are interested in functional languages, is it makes it much easier to work with concurrency because things don't change underneath your feet. So Haxel is an example of this, and as I mentioned, uh, it's used to filter every single entry posted on Facebook. Now another example, something very different, is SEL4. So SEL4 is an operating system that they have proved correct. So what that means is they wrote out a specification, and they wrote out code in C, and then they showed that both the specification and the code in C were doing exactly the same thing by writing and checking a mathematical proof using a proof assistant. So they didn't just write out the proof, but they got the proof past the computer, and you all know how picky computers are. Um, so this is an amazing thing. And the secret to doing this is, yes, they wrote a specification, and yes, they wrote code in C, and in the middle, they wrote the whole thing in Haskell. So first you write your high-level specification, then you write high-level code in Haskell, and then you write low-level code in C that does the same thing that Haskell is doing, and you do proofs to connect all of this. So um, that's a second example. So SEL4, that, this is an actual operating system for mobile phones that's proved correct. Um, and then another example is lots of financial institutions are now making use of functional languages, mainly because um, they may, since you're working at a higher level, it's much easier to write code quickly that does what you expect it to do. And if you're doing something like algorithmic trading, that's really important. You don't want to write a program that has a bug in it and actually get, accidentally gives away a few million dollars or pounds. So lots and lots of banks have taken to using functional languages. These are the ones that use Haskell, but there are many that use other functional languages. How many people have heard of Jane Street Capital? Oh, not too many, okay. So Jane Street Capital is a firm that uses the functional language ML to do all of their algorithmic trading, and they're big supporters of ML. So there are various places, financial institutions they're making heavy use of functional languages. As I say, these are the ones that I know of that use Haskell. Does anybody know of one I've omitted? Not yet. Okay. Okay, that's enough about Haskell. Any other questions about Haskell? Okay, so Haskell's done. What do we do next? So Agda 
in my opinion, is what Haskell wants to be when it grows up. So I mentioned uh, SEL4, which has been proved correct. That was using a proof assistant called Cock. Yes, that really is its name. <laughs> Sorry about that. I hope I haven't violated the um, agreements of how people at the conference are supposed to behave. Uh, so Ag is another one. So first of all, it has a name you can pronounce without being embarrassed. Uh, and um, it looks a lot like Haskell, but it's designed so that you can write programs in it, but you can also write proofs in it. And I'll say a little bit about how that works. Um, and it's really quite neat. So I'll say a little bit about this idea called propositions as types. But what propositions as types is about, it says that there's a, a very close correspondence between what we think of as logic and what we think of as programming in a typed functional language. So it basically says, well, all this logic stuff that people invented and all these type functional lo languages that people invented and the logic stuff, you might think it goes back 2,000 years to ancient Greece, but really all the important work on logic started in like the 1850s with Boole and then with Frege, and then they really got going in the 1930s with Gensen. So the form of logic that we use today was written down by Gensen in 1935. The functional languages that we use today are all based on lambda calculus, which was invented by Alonzo Church in 1932. And then he came up with the typed version in 1940. Okay, 1935 version of logic we use today, typed lambda calculus 1940, basis of all the functional languages we use today, independently invented by Gerhard Gensen and Alonzo Church. All you need to do, right, remember I talked about time scales? 1935, 1932, 1940. Finally, in 1969, somebody publishes the observation, wait, this and this, they're really exactly the same thing. And they write it down in a paper, and you look and you go, oh yeah, those are just the same thing. Wow, why didn't we notice that before? <laughs> but it really took that long to notice. It wasn't published until 1980. Okay. But that is the basis for all the proof assistance developed since, including AGA, which I'm going to show you today. So we can actually prove things based on these ideas. And um, people who know me know that I love puns. And here's the title of the textbook I wrote, Programming Language Foundations in Agda. Where's the pun? Okay, so the pun, those people who looked in the, um, at the title of the talk will know this, right, is you could, you could think of this as these are the foundations of programming languages developed in Agda. But you can also look at it this way. What we're doing is we're taking language foundations and we are programming them in Agda, right? Because we're going to prove properties of these things. Every time you prove a property, it's actually a computer program, right? This is great, right? Why is this great? Because, well, I don't know about you, but when I try to write a proof, I get sort of sad, right? And if I ever finish a proof, right, it's exactly like a cat, right? Cats are great. But right, what does a cat do? It just sort of lies around the house in the sun and it says, hello, I'm a cat, I'm very elegant. You should admire me. <laughs> I've got a question, which I'll get to in just one moment. Um, whereas, I think programs are like dogs, right? What do dogs do? Dogs come at you and say, hello, master, what can I do for you? Right? Programs are great fun. So I always get really excited about hacking. Oh, I get to sit down today and hack. I get really excited. Whereas if I'm doing a proof, I'm going, oh, I'm doing a proof today. Oh, well. So the fact that they're the same thing means now I can do my proofs by programming. Yay! Okay, you had a question. Oh, how are the Gensen system and the Lambda calculus the same? As I said, it's completely obvious once you look. So that doesn't help you very much, but I will say a little bit about that in more detail today, 
and they'll also give you references where you can look it up in even more detail still. So that's a fantastic question. I will get around to answering it, but not just yet. Okay, so actually what we should do, hold on, I'm going to pull out my phone so I don't lose track of the time. Okay. Enough of talking. Right, let's hack. So um, here's the textbook, ta-da, Programming Language Foundations in Agda. It's online. It's freely available. So I'm running it locally on my computer because I don't want to trust the internet during a talk. But <laughs> let's see. It says the Wi-Fi's hold up. Let's see if it's here. Oh, oh that's not right. No, I don't want my drive. Go away. Try that again. PLS. Yep, there it is on the web. So it's there on the web, freely available. Um, so, right, this talk is just to show you a little bit about what's in the book. But if you're interested, if you like anything in this talk, you're free to just go and read the book. And um, that's what I hope some of you will do, because obviously I cannot teach you everything in a 40-minute talk. I will now show you the most important part of the book, which is the dedication. To Vanda. Amor da minha vida. Vanda. No, you have to stand up. We're newlyweds. We're probably twice as old as everybody here, but we're the newlyweds. Now I've lost my place because I'm just buried in love. Okay. So, chapter one, natural numbers. Okay, so not everybody, could, right, natural numbers just means the numbers, zero, one, two, three, and so on. Right, zero was a brilliant invention, but that, that happened a while ago. Um, so, how many natural numbers are there? A lot, right, more than the number of stars in the sky. That's a big number, but, we can define all the natural numbers in that many lines of Agda code. So no notice that we use Unicode and Agda. So that says um, data n colon set. So set set, that's the way in Agda that you spell the word type. So we're just saying we're introducing a new type called funny, called Unicode n. And it's got two constructors, zero and suck. So suck is short for successor. Don't be rude. <laughs> so zero is a natural number. Successor takes a natural number and gives you a new one. And just from saying that these are constructors, we're enabling pattern matching, which we'll see examples of. And we're saying things like zero and successor are always distinct. So successor of a number is always different from zero. So that way we, uh, and indeed, we've, so I've written these out in a couple of different forms, one of which is the English that you can see here. So the base case is zero is a natural number, and the inductive case says if m is a natural number, then successor of m is also a natural number. Right, and so here are the, ex here are the examples, zero is a natural number, uh, okay, what else? Uh, oh, zero is a natural number, so its successor is a natural number. We have a shorter name for, the, for that. We often call it one. And then we've, we can ten, then take the successor of that. That gives us two. And the successor of that, that gives us three, which is pronounced suck, 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 zero, which may be another reason for using that name. <laughs> um, and so on. So there's a first exercise in the book is write out seven in longhand, right, which is a bit painful. Um, so th this is how it appears on the web as HTML, but what we'll also do, right, here it is just running on my laptop, and you can download it from GitHub and run it on your laptop. So here's the book written in Markdown, and everything written between open three ticks and closed ticks, three ticks is actual Agda that executes. So you notice, let's go back for a minute. Right, 
This bit here, the opening module declaration, you can see is in color. And then when I showed you this definition, it's in color. Um, and indeed, the keywords are in red, and the defined names are in blue, and the constructors are in green. So having it in color gives you useful information. But the most important thing about being in color is that means Agda has executed it. And as part of executing it, it's worked out which bits are the keywords, which bits are the defined names, which bits are the constructors. So it knows what color to make everything. So color means Agda actually executed it, which is great, right? It means if it says something has a given type, it really has that type. It's been checked by computers, so you know it's true. And I'm a big fan of taking textbooks and writing them so that they execute, so that there's certain kind of errors you can't put in. So whether you're writing a textbook on proofs, like I'm doing, or a textbook on coding, even if you're doing it in C, right, you can write your textbook so that all the C code executes. Um, I actually learned this technique from Brian Kernighan, who wrote the first textbook on C, called the C book. Um, he's a strong proponent of it, and I learned it from him. I'm a strong proponent of it. So all of you, whenever you're writing a tutorial or anything that has code in it, right, this is actually probably the most important thing I'll say in my talk, given the audience. Right, this is something you can all do. So, um, so I'll jump up and down so you pay attention to me. When you write code to explain things to people, make sure the code executes. Okay, that's a great thing to do. So this means the code has executed. And if we go here, you can see this is not in color, which means it's not executed. Sad. But I can go up to the menu. And I can say load. Ooh! Look what happened. Look, look, look. Look, 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 look. And look, 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 look. See, it's in color now. And even more important, see this window here? Right? What's written in this window? Hello, I can't hear you. Nothing. That's really exciting. Do you know what that nothing is? That's no type error messages. Yay! OK, so isn't this exciting? So similarly, right, we can define plus. Right? So if you're like me, when you were in grade school, you had to learn all these tables, right? You had to learn uh, the table um, for adding numbers. So I know all for all the digits from 0 through 9, what they are, like 7 plus 8, that's uh, 15. And then you learned how to do carries and everything. Right? It's pretty complicated, but you learned how to add numbers. But you can define it all in three lines, like that. So this just says plus takes I can't point to the screen there. Takes a natural number and a natural number and gives you a natural number. And remember, there are just two ways of making natural numbers. So there are only two cases we need to worry about. We say 0 plus n is equal to n. Or you can say successor of m plus n. What's that going to be? That's going to be successor of m plus n. Wait, wait, wait. You just wrote the same thing twice. No, I didn't. Because here the parentheses go like this. And there they go like that. So we've just moved some parentheses. OK? Um, and wait a minute. You've defined addition in terms of addition. Does that even work? Well, let's try it out. Let's look at an example. Here's an example. So uh, 2 plus 3, right? That's shorthand for suck, suck, 0 plus suck, 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 0. And then that's equal to, OK, so let's look at this equation. Oh, let's split it so we can look at both at the same time. There we go. Let's look at that equation. And then we can look here. 
So which of these two equations applies? Well, it begins with suck, so it's the second equation. And what is m? What does m have to be for suck of m to be suck, suck, zero? Of course, m is just suck of zero. And n will be suck, suck, suck of zero. And then we get successor in front of m plus n. So now it's successor of zero plus suck, 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 zero in parenthesis and successor of that. And if you're like me, you're already lost in all the sucks. <laughs> so it's much better to write it out this way. And then we can say, okay, 2 plus 3, that turns into, so 2 is successor of 1, so that turns into successor of 1 plus 3. So we've defined adding 2 and 3 in terms of adding 1 and 3, and 1 is smaller than 2. And then by the same rule, 1 plus 3 becomes successor of 0 plus 3. And then if you, we go back, You can see the equation for 0 said so 0 plus anything is just equal to that other thing. So 0 plus 3 becomes 3, and we're done. We've got the successor of the successor of 3, which is the same as 5. So 2 plus 3 is 5. Right? This idea only goes back to, who, who knows who came up with this idea? Piano, right, Giuseppe Piano. Um, just in the middle of the 1800s. So it's not a very old idea. But this is great. You can now write down the definition of addition in just three lines. And even better, I'm going to go on to the next chapter. Oops, that's too small. And then even better, we can prove things like associativity. So associativity tells us, oops, let's execute it. Oh, I have to. There we go. So now we can execute it. Yay, it's in color. Yay, this fits empty. OK, so now we can see, right, so 3 plus 4 plus 5 is the same as 3 plus 4 plus 5 parenthesized the other way. Uh, that's obvious, right? Well, let's work this out, right? So this is 3 plus 4 is 7. So this is telling us that 7 plus 5 and 3 plus 9 are the same thing. Well, they are. They're both 12. But as soon as you break it down and look at it, you're going, I, I don't know about you, but I'm going, well, wait, how do I always know this is going to work? Why is 7 plus 5 the same as 3 plus 9? Why should that always be true? So it would be nice if you prove it. And in computing, where we work with data structures that satisfy properties all the time, this is actually very typical of the sorts of proofs you want to do if you want to prove that your program works. Right? Not just test it, but prove it. By the way, some people will tell you if you've proved it, that means you don't need to test it. That's not really true, right? Proving and testing achieve, are different ways of achieving super, um, more confidence that your code does what you want. So you want to do both. And proving is very expensive, but there are times when you want to do that. So if we go down a bit, yep, here it is. Here is the proof that plus is associative. And OK, it's not just two lines. Right? This is about, which line number is that? That's line 229. That's line 249. So it's about 20 lines, this proof. But that's it. I have then demonstrated for all infinity number of cases. <coughs> and I'm not going to go into this in any detail, except to show that at one step here, what I do is I invoke associativity. So the proof of associativity 
invokes itself recursively. So when we're writing a code, we call that recursion. How many people are familiar with recursion? Right? Um, how many people are familiar with induction? Right, smaller number of people raising their hands. So the second thing to take away from the talk, boing, 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 is under propositions as types, those two become exactly the same thing. So all of you, th those of you in the audience who knew what recursion is and thought you didn't know what induction is, you do. It's just recursion applied to a proof. So I could go through this in more detail, but I'd like to finish on time. So I'm not going to go through this in any more detail. What I am going to do to answer the person who asked more about propositionist types. So that's the first important idea in propositionist types, is that uh, recursion and induction are the same thing. But another thing that you get is, so in logic, you've got things like conjunction. So you write A and B, meaning A is true and B is true. So what on earth could that really mean? Well, what that really means, right, so a product is named for a tuple type or a pair or a record, any of those things. So a record of an A and B has two fields, and your first field will contain something of type A, and your second field will contain something of type B. How many people are familiar with records of that kind? Ooh, hardly anybody's raising their hand. Okay, that's because I used the weird name product. Okay, so where I've said product, think of that as being spelt R-E-C-O-R-D, and then you'll be okay. So a product is just two things next to each other in a field, just like a record. So um, when you learn a little bit of functional programming, that becomes a very familiar idea. Oh, and this is really important, right? Because remember I said you can't change hello to hello? So it's the same thing. A record, the two fields of it can change independently underneath you. When everything becomes immutable, that's it. I've got a pair of the number five and the word hello. And this is always a pair of the number five and the word hello. That doesn't change. That's the idea of immutability. Um, so that's a familiar idea from functional programming. But it turns out this also corresponds exactly to the way that Gensen formalized the notion of conjunction in logic. What does it mean to have a proof that A is true and a proof that B is true? It means you've got two things. One is a proof that A is true, and the other is a proof that B is true. So the idea of conjunction, two things being true, and the idea of a product, the most basic data type in all of programming, where you just put two things together, those are, ta-da, the same idea. And then the same thing works with di for disjunction, which becomes record variance. The same thing works for implication, which just becomes functions. The same thing works for quantification, which becomes dependent functions. So I don't have time to go into that in detail. If you're curious, you can look at the book, or you can look at a paper I wrote for communications of the ACM called Propositions as Types. Uh, or you can drop me an email or something. But there are lots of places that you can look up more details of that. And I encourage you to do so, because it's the most interesting idea in the whole world. You can tell I'm a little bit enthusiastic about these things. Okay, um, that's actually all I was going to say about programming language foundations in Agda. The other thing I should say is it's great publishing a book on GitHub. So I'll show you the other important part of the book, which is the acknowledgments. And this has a long list of all the people who've made pull requests to fix bits of the book. And you can see it says your name goes here, right? You can just, it, it's, I never realized this when I wrote the book in GitHub, but it means people read the book and they will just submit pull requests saying, oh, you made a typo here, or you had this more fundamental error here. And so lots of people have helped me to make the book more correct, which is brilliant. So I encourage, that's the next best idea. Do things under GitHub so that people can correct your, read and correct your mistakes. Okay. So I've got about five minutes left since we started a couple of minutes late. And let's go back here. Okay, so we've talked about proving things correct. 
Can we talk about cryptocurrencies? Okay, so I consult for a cryptocurrency firm called IOHK. Skip over all that. You don't need to know any of that. Okay. So I work for a cryptocurrency firm called IOHK. We have a smart contract language called Plutus. How many people know what smart contracts are? Okay, a few of you. Okay, so there are only two things you need to know about smart contracts. One, they're not smart. Two, they're not contracts. <laughs> um, what they are is computer programs that are executed uh, on a blockchain. So we had to talk about peer-to-peer but one thing that wasn't mentioned about peer-to-peer -peer is the most successful use of peer-to-peer -to -peer today, which is cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin, Ethereum, everything else depends on peer-to-peer -peer networks where anybody can join the network and anybody can mine the next block. And you earn some of the cryptocurrency if you're the one that solves the hard problem and mines the next block. Solving the problem um, takes up a lot of computing effort, and that's the way in which they determine who gets to do the next thing. Um, that's a problem, right? Because in the modern world, using lots of electricity puts lots of carbon into the air, and we really shouldn't be doing that. So you'd really prefer to have a way of minting cryptocurrency that does not use up as much electricity literally as a small country. But that's what Bitcoin and Ethereum do. So Cardano is, uses uh, a different method than proof of work. It uses something called proof of stake, which basically says you roll a dice electronically and you get to issue the next block proportionate to how much of the money you own. Um, so, so people point out quite rightly, well, wait a minute, that means if you get more, have more money, you get to do it more often. But there are mathematical theorems that show these systems are stable as long as more than half the people don't cheat. If more than half the people cheat, then you're in trouble. So somebody earned more than half the money you would be in trouble. So you need to have enough money in your cryptocurrency that somebody can't buy up more than half of it. But if you have that, then you can use proof of stake rather than proof of work. And Cardano by IOHK is one of the systems that is trying to make use of proof of stake. There are others as well. Uh, and then you have systems like Ethereum that then run the code on the blockchain. And so that means every miner checks it, and you don't accept the program unless everybody has run it and said, yep, that's what it's supposed to do. So in a distributed way, everybody can agree, this is what should happen next by executing the program. So we have a language called Plutus. Plutus is just a library for Haskell, yay. Um, so you can write your smart contracts in Haskell. As I mentioned, right, lots of banks use Haskell because they want to be able to write their programs quickly, but make sure that they don't have an error in them that gives away literally millions of dollars. Um, anybody who is familiar with a system like Ethereum knows it's one defining characteristic. The one thing that you're sure to be able to do in Ethereum is, by mistake, write a program that gives away hundreds of millions of dollars. Right? This doesn't happen just once with Ethereum. It happens regularly every six months since Ethereum started working. So it's very common to have problems, and people have suddenly become really concerned about knowing that their programs do what they're supposed to do. So answer one, write in a functional language. And then to get even more reliability, what you might want to do is answer two, prove that your program does what you think it should do. So write a specification and prove that the specification and the program are in accordance. That would give you high assurance that it's doing what you want. So I, this is the ultimate goal for many people working in this area. We've got to start by working in Haskell, which is a functional language and at a high level, and so amenable to proof. And we've proved the meta theory of our system, as we've proved that the actual system itself is correct using Agda. In fact, using a framework that I set up for the textbook. Um, but I don't want to overclaim here. We don't yet have in place the mechanisms for proving all the properties of your programs that you would want. That's yet to come. So, whoops, right. Here are the different teams that I work with at IOHK. 
Um, but what I want to tell you is what language do we put on the blockchain? So Haskell's quite a large language. It's actually fairly hard to prove things about all of Haskell. So what you want to do is pick out the tiniest subset of Haskell that you can. And basically, we went back just almost to the 1940s. We went back to the 1970s. So this is what I just told you, right, which, which was that Alonzo Church and Gerhard Gensen, right? Gerhard Gensen came up with the formulation of logic we use today in 1935. Church came up with lambda calculus and typed lambda calculus in 1932 and 1940. There's, um, how many people have used generic types? Right, we have them in Java. Or type polymorphism? Parametric polymorphism, not, not, not the funny object-oriented thing. Uh, so type polymorphism comes from John Reynolds with something called the polymorphic lambda calculus. And Jean-Yves Girard, so John Reynolds is a, somebody who does computing. Jean-Yves Girard is a logician. And they did the same thing within a couple of years of each other, exactly the same system. And this is what we run on the blockchain at IOHK. The idea is, do you want to have a programming language that people can prove things in and that will work for the next 40 years? How do you get that answer? Use a language that's 40 years old. So that's what we do. Uh, there's the whole syntax of the language. I'm not going to go through that in any detail. Ah, but right, we, we've actually implemented and proved the properties you'd want to prove in Agda. We hired James Chapman the world's foremost expert to do this. This is what's great about Ethereum losing so much money, right? It gives you a business case to hire theoreticians to do interesting things. So we've done that. Oh, and then the other thing I have to say before I forget is we are hiring compiler engineers. So if you know a little bit, if you know Haskell and you're a good programmer and you'd like to work with our team, which is distributed around the world, Please come see me. We are looking for good people. Uh, I'm not going to go through that. OK, that's it. I wrote the, the um, book. I presented a paper of the book in Salvador uh, in Brazil at their um, formal methods conference. I won first place. Yay. Um, oh, thank you. I mentioned that Communications of the ACM has a paper that goes into more detail on propositions as type. So first step, you can read this paper. And then second step, if you really want to understand it and be able to execute it, you can read the textbook. Uh, oh, there's a video from Strange Loop if you want to see that. Uh, oh, yeah, I like this one. I just proved communication of multiplication in Agda and got way too much serotonin out of it. Silly face. Um, and, and then it says nice things about our textbook. Um, but yeah, that's the cool thing, right? When your proofs become programmed, you get the same serotonin rush um, when everything goes into color and you get no type error messages. It's just like killing off all the zombies in a video game. So there's where you can go to um, read the textbook or to download it. Uh, and please send your comments and pull requests. So I just want to leave you with one idea uh, to finish with. And um, I won't jump up and down. I'll, pull I'll take my clothes off instead. So the one idea I want to leave you with is when you have a hard job to do, you should think that this is a job for Lambda Calculus. <laughs> this may be the other violation of the Code of Conduct. Oops. Uh, there we go. Nope. There we go. Ah. Clark Kent never has those issues. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much.